Hey, Way family, thank you for tuning in. God has an amazing word for you, so go ahead and check out this message. And after, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you. God bless. Awesome. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And the title of this sermon is, I can't overlook the need. Say with me, I can't overlook the need. I'm going to read the whole story and then we'll dive into, we'll dive into it and break it down. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So there's a teacher, there's a lawyer, and he's not just any lawyer. He's a lawyer of Mosaic law. That means he's a lawyer of the word. He knows the word inside out. But he's asking a question. He goes, I know the word. I observe it to the best of my ability, but there's still something missing. I have no confidence that I have eternal life. There's people that are in the church that can be like that. You've been going through all the classes. You're doing your best to obey, but yet there's still something missing. You're not confident that you have eternal life. Well, he was there. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, what is it? What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus asked them, well, you want to know how to get eternal life? He goes, let's go back to the scripture, go back to the law. He goes, you know it, what does it say? Well, he answered correctly, the scripture says. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So he begins to ask, who's my neighbor? And I think he begins to ask, who's my neighbor? Because when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, with all of your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And I think when he said, and your neighbor as yourself, I think as soon as he said that, he started thinking about how he treated his wife that morning. And I think when he, when he said, love your neighbor yourself, he started thinking about all the people he was prejudiced against. I, said, I think he started thinking about that stranger that he cussed out on his way to church because the donkey crossed in front of him back in those days. He started going over his relationships. And he started saying, wait a second, I'm definitely not loving my neighbor the way I love myself. And then he asked the question, who's my neighbor? You know what he's trying to do? He was trying to bring down, bring down the standard to his life. He goes, if we could just narrow that down to just a few people that I really like, I think I can still obey that command. So he was trying, well, who's my neighbor? He's trying to find a way to still justify himself. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So Jesus goes into a story, and I really believe he's sharing this story so he could have that lawyer look at himself in the mirror, and he says, he's basically saying this, see if you could find yourself in this story. When God shares a story, it's not just a story. He puts us in the middle of the story and he's saying to us, see if you could find yourself in this story. Now there was a man that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and what happened to him? Some robbers, some thieves beat him up and beat him up so severely, um, robbed him and then stripped him of all his clothes, left him naked, but they left him thinking he was dead. So they, they annihilated this guy, left him in the ditch for dead. He wasn't dead, but they left him for dead. So they really beat him 
they stole from him. They left him in a, de- a really bad place. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A, a priest passed by. Now, you would be thinking at this point, wow, what a coincidence. The person that would help him has just showed up. A priest, his, fir- his full-time job is to help people. Finally, the Calvaries showed up. But the scripture says he doesn't help them. He passes right by. He passes by the need. He passes by the hurt. He passes by the broken, the shattered. He just passes right by them. And for him to pass by, he would have to do this. He would have to make an excuse for not helping. Because when God shows us a need and we don't help, we must make an excuse for not helping. And I could just think about his excuses. Well, I'm busy. I'm going to church for Wednesday night service. And he's missing it. He goes, no, this is the service. You go to, you go to church to help people. You just don't go to church to serve. You go there to be equipped to be an effective life changer. You missed it. Or maybe he said this, if I help them, that's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of time, which I'm not sure I want to spend on him because I don't even know him. Or maybe he says something like this, I'm sure someone is going to help him. All these are things that maybe we see ourselves maybe like this priest, that God showed us a need and somehow we talked ourselves out of it. And instead of helping, we made an excuse. We'll go on. The guy's still half dead, half dead in the gutter. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place. Now there's a, not, a Levite was a, a, he was a temple assistant or, a, well, let's just say this, a staff member in the church. So maybe the pastor wouldn't help. But surely the staff member would help. That's what they do. That's what they get paid for. That's what they went to school for. Definitely they will help. The scripture says that he more than saw him. The scripture says, this is what he did. He came and looked. There's a little difference now. So this guy, this Levi, he, he saw him and then he takes a closer look. He did a little bit more than the priest because the priest just saw and took off. But he took a closer look. But he takes a closer look and look what he does. <laughs> look what he, see what he does. I'm sure he's going to help. He took a closer look. He looked and passed by on the other side. So he passed by the need as well. The majority of people will ignore the need. And Jesus was now talking to this lawyer and he's telling them, lawyer, see yourself in this story because I think you think that you're righteous. I think you think you're a really good person, but Where are you in this story? Because I really think these priests and Levites more represents the crowd you hang out with. And while I'm telling you about the priests passing by the need, is it convicting you? Are you starting to realize that you're super religious, but you have no compassion and you have no love? Have you forgotten where you came from? Instead of helping people, you've now become a critical, you become critical, you become judgmental, you become a blamer, you become angry. 
could that become prideful? Has something happened to you that you forgot your purpose? He's talking to this lawyer. And I believe he's talking to some lawyers in here. And you know what that means? Is that we know the word, but knowing the word is not enough. We must walk in the spirit of the word and walk in compassion and love for the hurting and the broken. Can this happen? Yes. We can lose our first love. We can now start doing ministry with no compassion for the hurting and broken. We can get to the point that the people get on our nerves, that the people bother us. And if we're, we've gone to that point, this is time for us to repent and receive, come on, a renewing in our spirit and say, God, forgive me. I've been so busy doing stuff that I forgot to do it with your love and your heart. I lost my heart through it all. It's okay because we could have a new start today. So he passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had, what did he have? He had compassion. The other two didn't have any compassion. That means they had no sympathy for the hurting person. You know what really compassion is? Is you put yourself in their shoes and then you act. What is compassion? You put yourself in their shoes and then you what? Act. If I was in that ditch and I just got beat and I was just stripped and I was just robbed and I was left for half dead, what would I want someone to do for me, then you act. If you were abandoned, rejected over and over and no longer had parents and you had to grow up in a foster home and then you were rejected in the foster home at least three times and by the time you turned 18, you had no family, put yourself in their shoes and then ask and then act. What we want to do is we want to purchase a home for those kids that are aging out to make sure that when they're aging out, they're not aging out into hopeless, hope, hopelessness and homelessness, that they're aging out into a place of discipleship and care and instruction and family, and we could do something about it. We could do something about it, but it takes compassionate people to do that. Well, this man had compassion. But a certain Samaritan, his journeys came, and he had compassion. Verse 34, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and he sat, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He, he put him on his own animal. You know what that means? He was on a journey. And he put, him, he put him on his animal. I don't know what kind of animal it was. It, it was either this probably, a donkey, a horse, or a camel. But he put him on his animal, and you know what that meant? He would now have to walk. So the journey would take probably three or four times as long. And he also invested his resources into a complete stranger that he didn't even know. Why would you invest in a complete stranger you don't know? You could only do that when we, there's only way we could do it. We could only do that when we have a heart of compassion and we put ourselves in their shoes. We can have no compassion until we put ourselves in their shoes. Maybe the priest and the Levi were saying, well, he probably deserves it. That's why he got the beat down. Wonder what he did. So much excuses to actually do what God has called us to do. 
God is saying this to the way we're all outreach. We can no longer walk past the need anymore. We're going to stop and do something about it. See, compassion without action is not compassion. Compassion without sacrifice is not compassion. Compassion without giving is not compassion. I want compassion, but I don't want to sacrifice. I want compassion, but I don't want to give. <laughs> I, want some compa- I, want to, I want compassion, but I don't want to take action. It doesn't work that way. So he went, he, he, so he went to band, he went to, to him and bandaged his wounds. He went to him. He went to the need. He saw the need and he went to the need. Those that are hurting aren't necessarily going to come to us. He didn't wait for the man to say, I need help. He saw he needed help. The man couldn't even ask for help. He was half dead. We, we, this is what God is saying. I want you to be so alert to the hurt and pain and suffering around you that you don't have to wait for them to ask for help, that you would see their need and you would go to them and you would take your resources, your time, your energy, and you would help them because you have compassion and you put yourself in their shoes. So this is a story. This man, they said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus is now breaking, breaking it down and having him look at himself and Where are you in this story? Are you the Samaritan? Are you the priest? Are you the Levite? Or are you the man that's in the ditch? Because that could be you right now in this room. You feel half dead. You want to give up. Life is beating you down. You're broken hearted. You've tried. You can't get up. It seems like you're stuck in a cycle that's been passed on from one generation to the next generation. You feel tormented. You feel bound. You're angry. You're depressed. You're suicidal. And people are walking right past you. But today, someone is stopping. The Good Samaritan is stopping. The Good Samaritan is Jesus Christ. The Good Samaritan, His Spirit is in this church right now. The Spirit of God is here to help you. And God is saying, we refuse to leave you in the state that we found you in. God is here, ready to help you get back on your feet, to get healed up, to get restored. Today's your day. Your help is here. I love this that we could be the Samaritan or the good Samaritan every day of our lives. We could, we could now be aware of the hurt and pain around us and stop, put ourselves in their shoes. We must stop being so busy that we can't love people. We must stop doing ministry with no love. Because none of that profits. We must stop being religious. That we're more concerned about rules than people. You can't sit here. You can't sit there. I always say, I don't care what nobody says. You know, what I mean by that is, this is what I mean. If someone sits on the first row and they're homeless, and they got to that first row, and they're sitting in a chair I used to sit in, I don't care. I don't have a chair. Let them sit right there and let them praise God and worship God. Let's, I'm not saying we don't need order and structure, but be careful that, you, that the enemy has now twisted it, and order and structure has been more important than people. We must stop putting our rights over doing what's right. Well, it's, it's I'm right. It's the principle of the matter. I'm not going to let them get away with it. Enough is enough. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. 
I've had it up to here. What other sayings do we have that have nothing to do with scripture and love and compassion and purpose? Let's get rid of all that language and realize there's people that are hurting and broken and it's time for us to realize the greatest joy I'll ever find in life is helping someone that can't help themselves and allowing God to use me to touch them, to heal them, to bandage them up and use my resources to let them know you're loved. We care about you. God loves you. That's what the church is all about. I said this. There's no purpose for a church that doesn't change lives. There's no purpose for a church that doesn't meet needs. There's no purpose for a church that doesn't feed the hungry. There's no purpose for a church that doesn't stop to the poor and the forgotten and let them know, hey, I was in your position. I had major need, but there was a God that stopped by in my most desperate moment, and he stopped by through a brother and sister, and what God has done for me. I'm stopping right now. I don't care what my schedule is. I'll change it for you right now. God loves you. That's purpose. And then on the next day, look at this. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn. That means he took him to a hotel. He didn't take him to a house of one of his buddies. He took him to a place that he had to pay for to take care of him. He was not trying to find a shortcut. He didn't put him in his neighbor's garage. He found the best place he could find for him and he put him up there. But it's more than that. He took care of him. He followed through. He made sure, he made sure that the job that was started was completed. This is what he did. He bandaged them. You know what that means? Every single wound, he put, he put wine in it as an antiseptic. Then he put oil on the wounds to soothe them. Then he put bandages on him, a complete stranger. And I'm sure while he's bandaging them up, he's saying something like this. Hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this together. I'm here to help you. You don't know me, but I'm here and I'll let you know that God loves you and he loved you so much. He didn't leave you in this, in this ditch. I happened to pass by at the same exact time. It's not a coincidence. It's okay. You don't have to worry. I know you don't have to speak right now. We're going to get you to a place of health and strength. You're going to live you're not going to die. You're going to overcome. You're going to be free. Your needs will be met. It's, there's right now, a turnaround has just started right now, and I will, I will be with you until you're completely restored. I can hear those conversations. And he looks up. Maybe the, because it was a Jewish man that was beaten and a Samaritan that helped him. Now, being a Samaritan, the Samaritan had every excuse not to help the Jewish man. Say, so why would a Samaritan have an excuse not to help him? I'll tell you why. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews looked at the Samaritans like a half-breed people. And this is what they would say. If you see a Gentile woman that's ready to give birth, don't help her lest one more Gentile be born. Some of the priests would say that. And then they would say, but a Samaritan is even worse. So the Samaritan could have said this, if I was in a ditch, he wouldn't help me. 
And after all the hate that spewed out of his mouth, he reaps what he sows. Or he could have said something like this, the same people that beat him are maybe around the corner and maybe they can beat me. We have too many people that are trying to protect themselves from their purpose. We must get to a point that we love people so much that we'll even put ourselves in harm's way, in danger to help a person that's hurting and broken. Even if they're your enemies. This really spoke to that lawyer because this blew his mind. He was like, like, I'm sure when Jesus got there, there's a Samaritan that helped him. He's like, no, not a Samaritan. So you're telling me the Samaritan's going to be the hero in this story? The one we despise and hate? The one that I want to exclude from being a, a, a neighbor? Like, I didn't want him to be included in the neighbor definition. If you just take the Samaritans out, if you just take the whites out, if you just take the Mexicans out, if you just take the blacks out, if you just take the poor out, if you just take the immigrants out, then I could love. But then God says, no, they're all included. And if you don't love them, you can't love me. Because if you don't love the people you can see, how can you love a God that you can't see? Now you stop it. Maybe today we're not experiencing the fullness of life. Because he was asking, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You know what he was asking that lawyer? He was, the word eternal life is the word Zoe. And that word means this. Fullness of life that belongs to God. The assumption is this, that apart from God, we're empty. What he was saying, what, what was happening here is that this lawyer was in church his whole life, memorized probably half the Bible, but yet he still had no peace, no joy, and he was still empty. And maybe a religious person could be there, but a non-religious person could be there as well. What makes you, what's going to satisfy you? How much drinking can you drink to satisfy the emptiness and the hurt that's in you? You can't get drunk enough to fill the emptiness in your heart. You can't get high enough. You can't watch enough porn. You can't make enough money. You can't live in a nice enough neighborhood. You can't own enough things because the emptiness that the lawyer felt that every single one of us feel in our heart can only be filled by one person and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the one that owns fullness of life. Jesus was just trying to get this man to realize, hey, you're a sinner. You're off. You're empty, but I can help you. I'm just giving you this real story. It's a real story. This is not a parable. This is a real story. This really happened. A certain man, a certain priest, and a certain Samaritan. This was a real story. He just took the names out of it because he wanted us to place our names in it. Because I think as we look at this story, we could find ourselves as the priest. We could find ourselves as that staff member that walks by. Looks a little closer. I really looked into it. Yep, I verified there's a real need there. Them guys really need help. There's a lot of people that do a lot of research, but they, after they do a lot of research, they do a lot of nothing. They're an expert on the need, but they're not an expert on taking action. There's churches all over the world that are right now talking about stuff and not doing nothing. They got board meetings that are, that are super boring because there's never action taken because they're always looking to me. We got to make sure we turn over every rock. You know what God is saying? I show you a need. Stop trying to turn over every rock. It's time for us to take actions and sacrifice for those that are hurting and broken. 
So this is what he does. He took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took two, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So this is what he, I want you to get this. He finds him in a ditch. Everybody's walking by. We're highlighting the people that should have helped him. But there's, there was a lot of other people that passed by, regular citizens. The one person that shouldn't have helped him actually did help him because he had compassion. You know what God is saying? This is what God is saying. I'll use anybody. Stop counting yourself out. Stop, stop, stop allowing the enemy to bring up your past and make you feel like a nobody and make you think, I got to get my whole act together. No, right now, I'm going to show you a need. Get involved. I, I've created for purpose. Let's, I'll forgive you of your past. It's time to let go of the past and start moving forward and accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. Yes, God can use you. Say it with me, I'm a life changer. Yes. So we do. He not only bandaged him up, put oil to soothe him, put the antiseptic wine, puts him on his animal, walks with him maybe for miles, puts him in an inn. But this is what he did. He stayed up the whole night with him. A complete stranger. And the whole night as a man is fighting for his life. A Jew that probably cussed him out, spit in his face, maybe last week, he's now spending quality, loving, compassionate time with. You know who that reminds me of? Jesus Christ. That he meets us in our hopeless situation. We don't deserve it, but he gives us his love. And he, this is what's so cool about Jesus. Jesus has everything we need to get restored, and he's already paid the full bill. He's a lot like Jesus. Maybe Jesus is a Samaritan in this story. That's helping because Jesus was the outsider, even in his own community. The outsider was now coming in and helping a community that wanted nothing to do with him. God loves you. Do you know what's so great about God? He loves you when you want nothing to do with him. And he keeps knocking at your heart's door and he meets you in your pain while everybody else is judging you, criticizing you, walking out on you. God is showing up to help you, restore you, bandage you up. And then he spent time with you and he said, I'll cover the whole bill. I got it. Those that decide to be life changers, this is what's going to happen to them. They're going to have the love to help those in need, but they're also going to have the resources to help those in need because God is looking to help some people that are in need. And he's saying, if someone will take on my mission to help a group of people that no one wants nothing to do with, if they would be willing, I would transfer my resources, my love, my compassion. I'll make a way where there's no way for someone that's willing to help someone. So he spends the whole night with him. He still goes to his journey. He's going somewhere. He's still keeping his appointment. He's still taking care of business. So maybe he had a day's journey. He's going to come back maybe two days later. He covers them for two days, but he tells the innkeeper, I want you to do this. Spend whatever money you need to spend on him. There's no expense that I'm not willing to pay. I don't want to hear that you didn't help them because you didn't have money. Because I'm telling you right now, if you spend any extra money, I'll cover him. I got it. Is there a group of people in here that's saying, I'll cover it. I'll cover it. What, I'll cover them. I'll cover the, I'll cover the foster child. I'll cover, I'll cover that orphan in Kenya. Right now, there's a need that's presented itself to us. And this need 
started last year. There's an orphanage in Kenya. That means there's children that have no parents. And when I think about those orphans in Kenya, one of the things I think about is this. I thank God I wasn't born there to have to go through the suffering and the pain they've gone through. I'm not, I'm, gonna say, I'm not saying I'm better than them. I'm just saying we got to be grateful for the opportunity we do have in front of us and not take all these privileges and blessings for granted and not help anyone. Americans can become very self-centered and forget that there's hurting people all around them in the world. Imagine saying this, every single resource is mine and nothing for nobody else, including those orphans. And maybe we don't say that, but we say that by the sacrifices and the given that we're will not willing to make. These orphans, right now, there's a hundred of them and they were sponsored by a group of people that got together and they said, we want to take care of these orphans. And they built homes for them. They gave their lives for these orphans. There's two homes they built for orphans. They have a capacity to have 200 orphans in the homes. Right now, there's a hundred of them in the homes. Actually, there's 96. Why are there only 96? Because there's a problem. The group that was financing them or taking care of them for those years, most of them have already passed away. There were senior citizens that gave everything that they could. There was finally one supporter that was sending every penny she had. She was sending over five to $6,000 a month, every month. She refinanced her home and she finally met with the orphanage and she told them, I have no more money. I've given everything I have. It just so happened that the young man that was running that orphanage, he's 20 something years old and he's dedicated himself. He grew up in the orphanage and he's de dedicated himself to taking care of orphans, not dedicating himself to girlfriends, not dedicating himself to going out and seeing the latest movie. He's dedicating himself as a 20 something year old young man to take care of little boys and little girls that have no father, have no mother in their lives. Amazing. How did these, most of these kids become orphans? Most of them became orphans through the war. Most of them became orphans also through the poverty and also they became orphans through HIV. Many of their parents have died through AIDS. There's a little girl, Rachel, and Rachel, she went through the war, five years old. The war hit her town. She was with her parents. This was a town where the people were so scared that the ladies with their children went to the local church to hide. And when they got there, the mil the 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 enemy came in and burned the church down with the women and children. War broke out in that town. A hundred men that week raided her house, little Rachel's house at five years old. And when they raided her house, mama told Rachel, go into the kitchen. And her mom went into the living room to get her little boy. The hundred men went into the house Rachel got so scared that she began to run and run and run. She's terrified. She runs for three hours straight, just running, just thinking about the images and the violence and the pain. When she looks back, she sees her house on fire. That day would change Rachel's life forever. She would never see her mother again. She would never see her father again. She would never see her siblings again. She was now running as a five-year-old little girl on the streets looking for some help. She runs into another lady that's running. They're running together. And the lady, the lady says, come with me. And little Rachel was 
taken in by this lady. And she took her in as one of her own until she reconciled with her husband. And when she reconciled with her husband, her husband says, I don't want that little girl in the house. And Rachel was homeless and an orphan again. She was thrown out into the streets and how she was living was washing clothes. She said, I could wash your clothes. And she would do her best to wash clothes because she knew how to do that. And that's how she would eat. Every one of those 96 kids that are in that home have a story similar to that. God has put this orphanage on our plate. And this is what he's saying. I want you to step into the gap. I want you to take care of those orphans. And I want you to put yourself in their shoes. And I want you to act like it's you and then walk in compassion and then give. This was the letter that I got, no, I didn't get. As a matter of fact, Gary got this letter and he didn't send this letter to me, but this is, this is Brian's letter. He didn't say, he didn't give it to me. He, 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 could, he has access to me, but he said pray. But this is what he says, Papa, after coming from the USA, things have not been going well, especially the last two months. The two orphanages needs are overwhelming to me. With almost a hundred children, the burden has outgrown my capacity. Our staff members have really tried to work hard without salaries. We thank God for the way church, because they sustained us for a long time and made it possible to clear school fees for the kids this year. So last year we sponsored the kids and make sure that they would have their fees for school, make sure that they would get an education, make sure that they had food. So we sent them last year $30,000. We took an offering for them. But we thought maybe it was just an offering and then they would bounce back and get the support. But it hasn't happened. They said, we thank God for the way because they sustained us for a long time and made it possible to clear school's fees for the kids this year. But now... We are at a crossroads. Papa, please pray with us, especially at such times. Do you think the way through Pastor Marco can come to our rescue? May God bless you, son. You know, these are the kids. And when you look at these kids, these could be your kids. If you were born over there and you went through a war, you might not have been able to complete your assignment to father and mother them. And while you're gone to the other side or you're breathing your last breath, all you're doing is thinking about your kids. What's going to happen to my kids? How they're going to survive? The little five-year-old girl, how she's going to make it? Well, these kids right here, there's someone that loved them enough. Look at their faces. The real people, real hearts, real emotions that have really, really been abandoned. And if we don't step in, there's no one else stepping in. They've already asked for help over and over and no one has helped them. I thank God that we're gonna get an opportunity to help them this year and adopt every single one of them and then fill that house with 200 kids because there's kids on the streets right now. There's a scripture in James 1 27 it says this, the worship that God wants is this, care for orphans or widows who need help. The worship God wants is to take care of people that need help. So we're going to have that opportunity. This Samaritan did his best. So this is what the scripture ends with. So which of these three do you think was, was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. 
Don't do like the other two that just pass by the need. Do and do likewise. And what he's saying here, if you do that, you will fulfill your purpose. If you do that, you'll experience the fullness of life. And this is how we do that. First of all, you know what we need to do? Is realize I can't love like that without Jesus. I can't do that without God's love. The first thing I got to realize is, is God, forgive me for living life with me in the center. Forgive me for overlooking the needs and hurts of my neighbors. I want to help. But first change my heart. Make me new. Give me the gift of eternal life. And you don't receive the gift of eternal life by doing anything. You get the gift of eternal life by believing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, believeth in him, believeth in him, puts their trust in him, will not perish, will not be destroyed, but they would have everlasting life. They would have the fullness of life that we're looking for to experience in this world. It's found in believing in Jesus. Not yourself, believing in Jesus. Not believing in yourself, believing in Jesus. That's where you find fullness of life. It's a gift. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So this man, this lawyer, when he was talking to Jesus, he said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You know what he was saying? There's something missing in my life. I'm not full. I'm not complete. I got religion. I got status. I got money. But I'm still empty. And then Jesus points them to his faults. Not to hurt him, but that he would repent and realize, I don't have it. And the one that could give him eternal life was sitting right there. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. We pray that you were encouraged and empowered. Don't forget to check out some other messages we have on our YouTube channel and share, subscribe to thewayworldoutreach.org. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week.